This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you by Huckberry. Huckberry is my favorite place to shop online. Every week they feature new products. They got everything from clothing, camping gear, everyday carry stuff, pocket knives, wallets, stuff for your home. You name it, they've got it. And every week things are changing. They're highlighting and curating new products. They also, it's the one place you can get my favorite brand of clothing, Flint and Tinder. Pretty much everything I wear these days is from Flint and Tinder, from t-shirts to their selvage denim, Henleys, you name it, they've got it. If you want to try Huckberry out at a discount on your first time purchaser, just use code ART15 at checkout to get 15% off. So huckberry.com code art15 at checkout to get 15% off your first purchase at Huckberry. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Inside many men is the call for adventure. My guest today is one of those men, and listening to that call has led him to pursue a lifetime of amazing expeditions around the globe, all while balancing a demanding career as an airline pilot and family responsibilities. His name is Laval St. Germain, and today he shares when he first heard the call for adventure on his grandparents' farm in Western Canada and how he started taking action on it. We go through some of the adventures he's been on, including being the first Canadian to summit Mount Everest without oxygen, dodging land mines while climbing Mount Damavon in Iraq and rowing across the Atlantic Ocean by himself. Laval then shares how he tragically lost his son in a canoeing accident and how the habit of making checklists that he developed as a pilot helped lead his family through this very tragic time in the grieving process. We then dig deeper into how Laval uses checklists as a pilot, adventurer, and family man to improve his life. We end our conversation talking about how regular Joes go on the kind of adventures Laval regularly undertakes without breaking the bank and while still attending to their families and and careers. After the show's over, make sure to check out the show notes at aom.is slash Laval. That's L-A-V-A-L. We find links to resources. We can delve deeper into this topic. Laval St. Germain, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. They're really happy to be on. So you reached out to me last week, actually, and I'm glad you did because you are you're, you're, you're a contender for the real life most interesting man in the world. Um, <laughs> I don't so, drink Dos Equis, though. Okay, that, yeah. Okay, you don't drink Dos Equis. I hear it's not that great of a beer. <laughs> Anyways, so can you tell us a bit about your background? Because, okay, you're a pilot, but besides the pilot thing, which is pretty manly as it is, you've also created this life of yourself of adventure. So can you tell us just about what you do and kind of your mission in life? Sure, sure. Yeah, like you said, I'm uh, an airline pilot, but let's work backwards uh, to uh, my background. So um, if your American listeners can't tell, I'm a Canadian by my accent, but I'm from a small rural community in Western Canada in the Canadian province of Alberta, a small town of about 2,000 people uh, surrounded by farmland. And the community I grew up with with, was largely a French-Canadian community surrounded by a lot of German farmers around it. So my dad's French-Canadian, sort of a town boy from the town. My mom's a German farm girl from outside of that small town where, um, where I grew up. And my parents had a real love of the outdoors. Where we live, there were no mountains. It's, it's a prairie area, so it's farming country. But my dad was a big outdoorsman. He was a hunter, a fisherman, a canoeist. And my mom was uh, an athlete. She played volleyball. She played basketball. I remember going to her games when I was a, a small child. So I always had a love for the outdoors, and it was something that was quite normal for me. And then also my dad had his private pilot's license. So we always had a small Cessna type uh, aircraft kicking around a four seater or three seater or two seater aircraft, depending. We've had several different airplanes. So I was always exposed to aviation. So these are normal things to me, the the outdoors and flying. But one of sort of the seminal uh, points in my development, I believe, was uh, the summers and the Christmas holidays that I spent on my grandparents' farm where my mom grew up. This was only about uh, eight kilometers or about four miles from where uh, where we lived in this small town. And my dad and I used to walk to the farm uh, along the railway tracks that went to this farm. And back then, of course, uh, there were no plastic bottles. We didn't have any Nalgene or that type of thing. So we would fill up a 7-Up bottle, what in Canada we call a pot bottle, a glass bottle with water. We'd put it in a little backpack. We'd walk down these tracks. And I would ask my dad about things that I'd read in National Geographic or things that I read in the encyclopedia. This is, of course, before the time of the internet. And he would tell me stories about places all over the world, these places that were so far away and so removed from where I was that I always had this, this real fascination for them. And that fascination started to really evolve when we got National Geographic as a kid. But back to uh, going to the farm, the lessons that I learned on that farm were really being a free-range kid. We had unsupervised, 
unstructured play, my cousins and I and my sister, who's a year older, and we simply roamed around on this farm. We were involved in slaughtering the chickens, milking the cows. We were involved in bailing. We were involved in uh, constructing things. And as long as we were back on time for lunch when my grandma made lunch or back in time for dinner and back when the lights or when the sun went down in the evening, which is quite late this far north, everything was fine. Uh, so it was this free range lifestyle that I think is so remote from what we have nowadays. And even uh, more so, uh, you know, we we're allowed to drive tractors, trucks, combines as young kids and I'm talking below the age of 10 I was driving a standard so I had this uh, real comfort with machinery and the outdoors so for somebody who's evolved into the type of activities that I've evolved into is a real natural setting to develop my love of uh, of the outdoors and confidence as well I was going to say I mean okay so you you spend time outdoors in the farm and that's Oh, but like you're doing now some crazy stuff and we'll talk about some of these these adventures you've gone it's so like at what moment in your life did you decide, I'm going to, you know, for example, we'll talk about your solo North Atlantic Ocean rowing trip, right? Like, how did, at what moment did you know, decide, like, I'm going to be an adventurer like these guys I read about in National Geographic? It was uh, right then. I mean, it, it, one story to sort of illustrate it was uh, when I read Tarzan as a young boy, I don't know, I was probably nine years old. Uh, I spent that summer not wearing shoes soon as the snow melted, I didn't wear shoes until the snow fell again, literally running through the trees, toughening my feet, trying to toughen my feet the way I read that Tarzan did in the book. So I decided that I wanted to be like Tarzan. I read Jack London books, obviously, about the Yukon and the gold rush and Farley Mode, who's a Canadian uh, writer, and Ernest Hemingway. And, and for some reason, maybe it was um, the, the confidence my parents instilled in us, but I never had any doubt that I could go out and do these things. I just had to figure out how to get them done. So right at an early age is when I decided I wanted to do this stuff. I mean, <clears throat> I've been really fortunate that I've been able to live this sort of this ultimate boy's life, uh, you know, being an airline pilot and being an adventurer and go to the jungles and the deserts and the, the mountains all over the world. And that started as a child. And I think it had something to do with the confidence my parents gave me to do whatever I wanted. So sounds cliche, awesome. but I really think it, it had a large part to do with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah the stories of like pe kids reading National Geographic, I don't think th that really happens anymore because I don't think people subscribe to National Geographic, the magazine. I wonder what the, what's going to inspire adventurers in the future. I don't know. Just a thought. Um, so can you talk about some of the, the, the adventures you've been on? Because this, this isn't just like little micro adventures. These are actual like feats of endurance that uh, you've been on. So can you kind of take us through sort of the, the, the resume of adventures you've been on? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if they're going to be in order because there's been a few. But, um, you know, I've uh, climbed, uh, I guess I'll go from sort of smallest to largest. Not, not that there really is a scale, but uh, I sort of started my ski mountaineering life in the Cascades of the northwestern U.S. I was a, a young airline pilot based in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and I would uh, drive down to as far as uh, Northern California and climb and ski, rock climb, ice climb, and ski these big volcanoes around the Pacific nor Northwest. And then as an airline pilot, one of the greatest benefits of it, and one of the reasons I did it, other than the love of flying, is that you get travel benefits in airlines all over the world. So I was able to very inexpensively fly anywhere I wanted for next to nothing, for less than what a dinner would cost. So I uh, went uh, scuba diving in Honduras, even though I didn't know how to scuba dive, flew down to Bolivia and climbed the highest mountain in Bolivia, which almost killed me from high altitude cerebral edema. But uh, even though that happened, I seemed to have a propensity for suffering. I loved it and I was hooked. Then I went down to uh, Argentina, climbed the highest mountain in South America called Aconcagua. I did that on my own, climbed the highest mountain in Mexico, Went to Denali, climbed the highest mountain in your country and the highest mountain in North America, Denali. Kilimanjaro, Mount El Elbrus. And then suddenly I realized that, geez, I'm ticking off some of these continental high points. Elbrus being the highest mountain in Europe, which is in Russia near the uh, Chechen border. And um, that started to really whet my appetite for more mountaineering, but not just the seven summits. I like going to unusual places, places that I either read about or were intrigued by because they were in the news. So I went to Iran by myself, and I climbed the highest mountain in Iran and skied down it, a mountain called Damavan. I became an adventure racer, so I started doing these eco-challenge type races, so mountain biking, there's a paddling uh, part of it, uh, trail running, navigation, that type of thing. Uh, mountain bike racing, ice climbing, and eventually 
decided that, hey, I was going to do Everest. And what's really interesting about my Everest um, expedition was that I did that in uh, 2010. And about December 2010, I decided I had to ask slash tell my wife, Janet, that I was going to climb Everest. So we sat down at, at our kitchen counter and I poured her a glass of, uh, I can still remember, it was an Argentine red called Luigi Bosca, and I poured her a glass of red wine. And I was trying to get my courage up. I poured her another glass of red wine. She probably thought I had ulterior motives. And then I said, babe, I think I'm going to go climb Everest this spring, and I'm going to do it without oxygen. She took a sip of her wine, didn't even pause, looked up and said, it's about time. You're not getting any younger. So that's the type of woman that I was fortunate enough to marry. There was no questioning of it. She never had any um, doubt that I could do it. She basically just said, go get it done. So in, um, yeah, so the end of March of 2010, I flew to, uh, to Nepal and then into, we drove into um, Tibet. And um, two months later, I was uh, standing on Everest, becoming the first Canadian to climb it without oxygen. You know, not without mishap. Uh, we had some tragedy on that trip. We lost uh, one of our expedition members to uh, high altitude cerebral edema just uh, at the summit. He died, 27-year-old from the UK. And uh, I, uh, on the climb to the summit, froze three fingers in my right hand. And then about a month and a half later, after returning to Canada, I had them amputated. So um, I did pay a price, but I think it's a very um, minor price compared to uh, what Peter um, Peter Kinlock, the guy who died in our expedition, uh, paid. So did you do any special training for this, for the, the Everest summit? Well, I've, you can tell by my resume that I'm active. I work out every day, both uh, using weights, body weight especially, and endurance. So a lot of cycling and a lot of running. And, you know, uh, ultra running was a, was a big help. However, once you get sort of above the death zone, so above 26,000 feet, until you've been up there, you don't really know if you've got the genetics to do it. And that is just simply a crapshoot. It's either you've won the, the genetic lottery or you haven't because um, at those altitudes, there's only – I think the number is about two to four percent of the population can can function at these altitudes. Uh, your brain starts to swell. You start to develop fluid in your lungs called pulmonary edema. Cerebral edema is obviously the fluid in your brain. And uh, there's speculation that uh, genetics is one of the reasons that some of us can can um, can maneuver up there. But it, it's an interesting question because I think I had such good fitness going into Everest and then as we ascended across the Tibetan plateau, at every place we stopped for the night, I'd be the guy that would out, be out running or climbing the nearest peak or the highest peak I could see in the region. So I was always pushing myself to adapt quickly to the, to the thinner air at altitude. And even at base camp, I'd be off in the distance doing push-ups, I'd be doing crunches, and I'd be running in the hills as soon as I was able to run at that altitude and climbing all the mountains around base camp on the north side of Everest. So using an aviation analogy and um, sort of to go to, to explain this aviation analogy, I spoke to a U-2 spy plane pilot once in Denver, Colorado, and he told us about flying at such high altitudes that the Russian interceptors could get to them, but once they got there, they couldn't maneuver, so they'd simply fly by in a parabolic arc and dive out of the way. And sometimes it'd be so close that they would actually give him the finger from the cockpit just letting him know that, that the Russians had him in sight. But they couldn't maneuver. They couldn't do anything to sort of harass him. And I think that my fitness was like the afterburners on those, on those Russian fighters. It pushed me up to altitude. But luckily, I had the genetics, or we'll call it the wing, if we want to use an aviation uh, analogy, that allowed me to maneuver up there, allow me to function, and allow me to get back down there alive. So my fitness pushed me up there. My genetics are the ones that allowed me to survive up there and get me back down without oxygen, even though I did lose um, three fingers from frostbite. Yeah, so losing three fingers from frostbite. So that, that happened on the way up, you said, right? Yeah, it, had, it was a, a 10 and a half, uh, sorry, a 17 and a half hour day. Um, 17 hours and 35 minutes is what it took me to go from high camp to the summit and back to high camp. And about uh, two and a half, three hours out of high camp, I froze uh, the three fingers on my, my right hand. But having said that, it's not because it was cold. Um, it was obviously cold, but I'm a Canadian. I've done expeditions all over the world, including the Canadian Arctic, and it wasn't really that cold. It was probably minus 25 to minus 35, which is, you know, it's all relative. But for me, that's not that cold. I've got the equipment. I've got the experience. This is, this is stuff that I'd walk to school in as a child, these types of temperatures. But 
I made a mistake. I had the wrong equipment. So the Jumar or the device that attaches to the rope that you slide up the rope as you climb was not designed for these heavy duty, really puffy Himalayan sized mitts. So when you put your hand into there, it compressed the down, which of course reduced the insulation around my fingers and caused me to, um, to lose my fingers. So that is just an example of taking responsibility for a mistake and then learning from your mistakes. So I don't whine, I don't whinge, I don't moan about how cold it was in Everest. Sure, it was cold. But the only reason I lost that, those fingers was because of my mistake. And that's something I've learned from aviation, that you know, 99% probably of all airline accidents are due to human error, or what we call pilot error. And if you dig down into, uh, in your country, what they call them, the NTSB reports, uh, here we call them the TSB reports when they study an airline accident, you'll see that it's human error. And uh, I just made a mistake. I wasn't prepared because of the wrong Jumar I used. I took a shortcut and I paid for it by losing my fingers. So. And how quickly did you get back to adventuring after you had your fingers amputated? Uh, let's see. Uh, I was at the gym the day after I had my fingers amputated. I was running that day and on my bike, just being a little bit ginger with my uh, right hand, but I was right back into it. I, my son at the time, who's now 15, was eight, and I had my fingers amputated, and about a week later, we were riding our bicycles from the, the city where I live, which is Calgary, to uh, another town called Drumheller. So we did a, about a 100-mile a bike ride right after that, so... It, 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 a few fingers lost is not that big of a deal. It doesn't really impede you that much, other than maybe with typing. And I'll never be a hand model. Right, right. What'd your wife think? Was she just like, you idiot when you got back? Or was she pretty devastated? Or did she was like, okay? Oh, not at all. She she realized that, that if you're going to do this type of stuff every once in a while, something's going to happen, right? You're going to you're going to suffer injuries. And, you know, I've been very fortunate uh, for considering what I do that I've had some fairly minor injuries. And uh, I would consider that a minor injury. I consider it a failure. It, it, it eats at me and it bothers me. But, it, um, you know, she, uh, she was there when the amputated was just local anesthetic. She didn't find that too impressive watching that. But it's just, I think it's just the scars and the stories that you accumulate through an active life. And that's one of the things that I'll uh, always have is, is the three stumps. The three, the three stumps. I like that. <laughs> so, okay, you're the first Canadian to summit Mount Everest without oxygen. What else have you done? Because I think you said they get bigger and bigger. So you've done some other stuff as well after that. Yeah. And then I got back from there and I, um, I went down to climb the highest mountain in Australasia. So we as mountaineers have taken all of Southern Asia, meaning Australia, New Zealand, even though Australia is a continent when we've, because the highest mountain in Australia, Mount Kosciuszko is so small, we've decided to take the highest mountain in sort of the archipelago of Indonesia, the Philippines, including Australia and New Zealand. And there's a mountain in the jungle in Indonesia, Papua, Papua province called Karstens Pyramid. And I did this really incredibly tough, rewarding trek through the jungle just this classic mountain trek through the jungle with uh, local porters that were going on strike. We were held up at log bridges with porters with uh, bows and arrows and spears demanding money. We had uh, Porter Rebellion. We, um, it was just a really incredibly good trip. And we went into the deep, dark jungles of Indonesia. We climbed this, uh, the highest mountain down there called Karsten. So that's one thing I did, loved it. Another different trip for me because I'm not a real jungle guy. But I have some, done some stuff in South America. But this was uh, really an incredible trip, sort of the classic jungle expedition. And then after that, I came back uh, and I went and climbed the highest mountain in Iraq, which was really unusual. It was before the rise of ISIS, so 2013. I traveled into the border region uh, by myself between Iran and Iraq, and uh, I had hired a fixer, a local guy in Erbil in northern Iraq and Kurdistan, which is sort of the the, the least um, violent area of Iraq. It's a semi-autonomous region run by the Kurds, and I found a guy who spoke Kurdish and Arabic and got a vehicle, and I said, here's where I want you to drop me off, and I want to pick once you pick me up here a week later and he said you won't get there because of the military checkpoints so we traveled through the military checkpoints and everyone uh we somehow sweet talked our way through at the last one that was nearest the border with iran he asked what the westerner was doing in the car and my fixer said that uh, he was just going to look at the mountains for the day even though i had about a 
60 pound backpack with an ice axe and skis and ski poles in the back seat of this Toyota. He dropped me off and I wandered off into the mountains of Iraq along the Iranian border in an area that was just littered with landmines. So this uh, added a whole different challenge to uh, backcountry skiing when I had to tiptoe through landmine fields going rock to rock. So I wouldn't step on any earth that could have been dug up and set off a landmine. And uh, after a few days, I got uh, uh, near the top of the highest mountain in Iraq and then summited and then telemark skied down. And telemark skiing is that skiing where your heels are uh, free. I telemark skied down. And then to make a long story short, I made it back down to where my fixer was picking me up. And uh, on the way down there, I saw some unusual tracks in the mud. They look like military boot tracks. And sure enough, the Iraqi security forces had been hunting me up there. I don't think they were hunting me to, to do me any harm, but to keep me away from the Iranian border, because this area is very famous for, it's a region where in 2009, I believe it was, three Americans were kidnapped and held for, I think, up to two years by, um, by the Iranians and had to pay a massive uh, ransom. And I was, uh, they suspected that I'd been kidnapped by Iranians, and they were, I think they were coming up to save me. In fact, uh, on that trip by myself one night in the tent, I heard somebody cough outside my tent early in the morning. And uh, as I looked under the fly of my tent, I could see a guy in khaki pants standing there at the bottom of his legs holding a gun. The, the butt of the gun was on the ground by his feet. So I thought, this is it. The jig's up. I'm about to be kidnapped like those Americans. But it turns out it was a local Kurdish hunter hunting Ibex. And we had some chocolate and tea and spoke in sign language and off he went. I got down to the bottom of the mountain. First security checkpoint I went to, just a few kilometers after getting in the car, I was uh, picked up by the Iraqi security forces and was interrogated for about four hours in various buildings. Funny enough that one of their buildings interrogated in me was called the CIA. And after uh, four hours of interrogation, they couldn't really uh, prove that I'd been into Iran, even though I had crossed the border because the summit of the mountain is right on the border. And it's, it's in fact, it's about 80 meters into Iran. And they let me go. So that added a little bit of excitement to the trip. And I became the first person to ever uh, climb and ski that uh, mountain in Iraq. It'll probably never be done again because it's such a dangerous area full of landmines. That's great. And how long ago was this again? That was uh, 2013. Wow. And then uh, that same year, I came back and did a trip in Canada's high Arctic, uh, another ski mountaineering trip to a pretty iconic mountain up there. And on that trip, instead of landmines, we had a uh, sawed off uh, 12-gauge shotgun and always patrolling for polar bears that were uh, uh, in danger of hunting us down. But luckily, we didn't see any. So so some pretty unusual uh, challenges, something more Canadian like avoiding polar bears and something definitely more Middle Eastern like uh, avoiding landmines. So I've done some some unusual stuff. And then, and the latest thing was uh, really outside my comfort zone. I, I can't even describe how far out of comfort zone it was for me, but I decided to take a solo ocean rowing boat, a 20 foot long one person boat, uh, about uh, four feet across and 20 feet long. I row it from mainland of North America, the mainland of Europe. So I rowed from Halifax, Canada to um, Brest, France, 3,100 miles across uh, the North Atlantic by myself. And that was um, a real step into uh, a, a real step outside my comfort zone and out, outside of my wheelhouse for sure. What, what, okay, first off, how long did it take for you to go from Halifax to France? 53 days. I planned for 100 days. That, that route had only been done once before in history from mainland Canada, mainland Europe. And it took that Canadian uh, female... 129 days and she had to be rescued mid-ocean and resupplied by a cruise ship but uh, I was bound and determined to do it under 129 days without any aid whatsoever and I did it in uh, 53 days and came into Brest, France on a very foggy day August of uh, 2016 with my wife standing on the dock so it's quite a quite an expedition that one. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. All right, are you a hiring manager at a corporation or are you a small business owner who's hiring? If so, do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Finding great talent can be tough. You got to post your job on multiple job sites, then filter through all the applications you get, do emails, callbacks, et cetera. It's a big pain in the rear. Thankfully, with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. And they also have this dashboard where you can just quickly analyze things and then just send out the, the offers quickly right there in there 
No more emails, no more callbacks. It's just all super easy. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within just 24 hours. Again, no more juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. So find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash manliness. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash manliness. One more time, try it for free, ziprecruiter.com slash manliness. Also by Cooper Tire. Fall is here and along with cooler temperatures, it's bringing great rewards thanks to the return of the Take the Money and Ride event from Cooper Tires. For a limited time, you can receive up to a $100 Cooper Tires prepaid card when you buy a new set of four qualifying tires. And these aren't just any old pieces of rubber, they're great Cooper Tires that include the high-performance Cooper Xeon RS3-G1TM, the long-lasting Cooper CS5 Grand Touring, the rugged Cooper Discover AT3, and many more. Now that you can claim your reward of up to $100 during the Take the Money and Ride event, there's no reason to wait. Stop in today, discover why smart drivers have been counting on Cooper for great tires made by passionate people since they opened their doors back in 1914. For more information on Cooper Tires or to find a Cooper Tires dealer near you, visit coopertire.com. Again, that's coopertire.com. And now back to the show. Yeah. And what, what you said this is completely out of your wheelhouse. What inspired you to, to do this uh, adventure? Brett, that's a tough one. I think I aim for blank spaces on the map. I think I've, there must have been something that I read as a child or that I'd followed either as an adult. And this chunk of ocean, this blue expanse between Canada and France, for some some reason, really pulled at me. I'm of, I'm of uh, a mixture, but I'm French Canadian and German, and and I really thought to do a trip the way my ancestors came to North America, although backwards would be uh, pretty unique to uh, to row a boat versus sailing in a boat, but to uh, row a boat, human-powered, across the North Atlantic, it just seemed like a, it seemed like a challenge that was uh, going to stretch me to my limits. And then coupled with that, two years previous to that, we tragically lost our, our son, Richard. We Our 21-year-old son was... Um, just got hired as a young bush pilot, so a pilot flying in the north in Arctic Canada, and he was canoeing on uh, the Mackenzie River, which is the second largest river in North America after the Mississippi, and he um, was with a pretty girl that he was starting to date from the town that he was in. It was 9.15 at night, and in the summertime in northern Canada, it doesn't get dark, so 24-hour daylight, so bright sunny day, and the canoe flipped, and uh, he stayed with the canoe, and she swam for shore, and... Um, we found his body eight days later and um, that um, that uh, tragedy was such an existential hit to us as a family and um, for some reason I decided to bury myself um, out at sea alone on the water. I think in some ways it was um, cathartic and therapeutic and allowed me to somehow get maybe a little closer to Richard um, by, by doing that. So that's why I chose one of the reasons I chose the ocean and um, it was uh, especially difficult. I celebrated the second, I shouldn't say celebrated, I marked the second anniversary of Richard's death in the middle of the uh, North Atlantic on a sunny day with uh, a pod of dolphins keeping me company. So it was, it was quite something. Well, I'm, I'm really, really sorry um, about your yeah. loss. Um, but I mean, that's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, for me, it's like, I think it's crazy that you would just go right back to it. So I think for a lot of people to have a tragedy happen like that to a close family member, to a son, they'd be like, they would want, they wouldn't have want anything to do with that again. Um, yeah, it's it, it, and I, and it's really hard to explain. I think that you know, I I, know, I think I believe I've heard that you're a parent now, Brett, and there is nothing like losing a child it really is the worst nightmare and what it does is it there's nothing good that comes out of it but just let me let me preface that by saying that it's the loss of a child or the loss of a close family member is this it, it, there's this permanent injection of sadness that is now injected into your life at all times but i, I want to be clear that doesn't mean that this injection of sadness means that you're inoculated against ever being happy again you can still be just as happy as you ever were. You can still experience joy and you can still experience wonder and you can still laugh. And, and for moments of your life, it's not hanging over you, but at the same time, it's always in your system. 
So multiple times a day, you will miss him. You will be reminded by him. You will see his younger brother move like him or talk like him or say something that he would have said, or you find yourself wearing his t-shirt or his jeans or his boots. Or, and what it does is it gives you as a person and, and especially as a couple and as a family, this new relationship with, uh, with death. And, uh, you know, death is part of, of life and that, um, the, what I'm trying to say is that it gives you this newfound wisdom, maybe, on the on how tenuous life can be, and um, how one little error from an experienced canoeist on a summer night can end in a 21 year old at the height of his powers uh, drowning. And it's, um, I think you come out with, you know, we we were bound and determined not to come out with PTSD, and I think we trained we tried to change it into like. A, a PTG or post-traumatic growth where we, we, we did everything possible to, to come out of this healthy as a couple and as a family. So that meant grief counseling. That meant talking about it openly. That meant revisiting our memories with Richard on a daily basis, pictures of him all over the house. And, 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 and that occurred from the moment I got that call at two 30 in the morning from the RCMP or what we call the Royal Canadian Mounted Police here in Canada. And, when you get that call at 2.30 and he says, this is Constable O'Quay of the Norman Wells RCMP, are you the father of Richard St. Germain? And then he gives you the news. And I went right back to my aviation background and I sat down on the bed for 15 minutes. Uh, I was sleeping in my youngest son's room that night because he was in our bed. And I just sat there and I started to go through a checklist, a checklist of what I needed to do now as a man and as a father to, to handle the death of child. And um, I followed that. Um, got my wife, brought her into the room, quietly told her, you can imagine, but she's an extremely tough uh, lady. And um, she was uh, devastated, but by staying busy, by following this checklist, we were able to, um, to fight our way through this and um, hopefully did get some of that PTG at the end, that, uh, that growth that comes out of a horrible loss. Yeah, I, mean, what, I mean, what was on that checklist? Was it uh, just it honoring was, his memory every day that what you were talking about earlier? Well, the immediate checklist was what, are, what do I have to do now? So at the moment, who do I have to tell? How am I going to tell them? How am I going to handle this? I had, to, I had to recruit my brother into it. He had to tell my mom before this got out on social media. We had to tell her daughter who was, who was uh, she's a ski coach and she was doing training that day. Uh, we had to tell Janet's mom. We had to make sure that People that were immediate family found out from us. So we actually made a plan like to the, you know, not to the minute, but to the half an hour of how we're going to get to all these people and tell them. And then we started to work through the process of what we're going to do. I wanted to go up to the river. I wanted to thank the people who were trying to find him and to try and rescue him. At that point, there was still a recovery uh, mission going on. But when you're, uh, when you're sitting on a river that's five kilometers across and, and um, somebody goes missing, you, you unfortunately know what the consequences are. So we flew up there 48 hours after it happened and talked to the rescuers and thanked them. And, and uh, we just stayed on that checklist. And, and that's what I've used for everything in my life is especially in, in expeditioning is this aviation um, discipline of of risk management, double checking things, redundancy, making sure I have the stuff I need. And then I literally, for example, if, if we want to get away from the tragedy part of my life is that even on the boat, I had a, a abandoned ship checklist and it's, and I, I structured it just like I would an emergency checklist on the Boeing 737 that I fly. And I would review it in storms. I would, I would have it out and I'd be reading it and getting ready because I was, you know, the boat was getting crushed by waves. It had capsized and this happened multiple times. And, 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 and checklists, I think, are really important in life. It gives you a structure. It gives you a way to cover, prevent errors. You're never going to prevent them, but mitigate errors or reduce them. And I think it really helped in my case with, with the ultimate disaster of, uh, of losing Richard. I was able to bury myself in this checklist in quotation marks and uh, get the family through it. And not on my own, but we did it as a, as a team. I even use this check, checklist analogy to waking up in the morning. Uh, you know what makes a good day for yourself, Brett. You know that uh, if, if you're if a good day to you means you're going to spend some time with your children, you're going to have a, a good breakfast, you're going to make yourself a good coffee, you're going to have an excellent workout, you're going to do a good podcast interview, you're going to write a blog, whatever. I'm using you as an example. You know that already. So when you wake up in the morning, you could jot that down. What's going to make a perfect day for Brett McKay? And you write that down, you just do it. 
So by the end of the day, if you haven't done it all, you haven't completed the checklist, but at least we all know what makes a good day. There's no reason that we have to wake up and just take the day as it occurs or just take life as it occurs. We know, we, 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 we know the secret, but for some reason we just let it happen. We let it sort of roll over us like a wave versus uh, get involved and, uh, and, and manipulate life the way we want to. Yeah, I love this idea of checklist. Um, so I, you, you know, you, you've mentioned how you've written out these checklists for specific emergency situations and you had this checklist you created on the fly when your, your son tragically died. I'm curious, and you, you, it sounds like you do like a checklist for your day, but like, do you have other checklists for other situations, like very specific situations? Because I know like for a pilot, like there's like, you know, a checklist for... Uh, you know, pre-takeoff and there's a checklist for takeoff. And there's a checkoff. So like, do you get that specific with your life? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and absolutely. Yeah. You, uh, for anything you do in life, you can use that checklist or those checklists. So for like you alluded to with aviation, we have these macro events or these, these flight segments or what we call phases of flight. And the, the real critical ones are obviously takeoff approach and landing. Those are the critical parts of flying. You want to make sure the flaps are set and the trim is set and the landing gear is down, all this stuff. Because if that stuff's not d- done, you're going to die. It'll kill you. So so we use those checklists. and 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 But each one of those macro events, meaning those flight segments, are broken down into smaller segments. So here's an example. Rowing the ocean. There is no checklist for rowing an ocean. There is no there, there, if I wanted to become a, a, a pilot, I could follow the procedures to become a pilot. I get my student pilot license. I get my recreational pilot license, or I think in the States you call it the sport pilot license. I get my private pilot license. I follow these items. But when you do something like climb a big mountain or row an ocean, you have to, you have to write down what you think you're going to require to come back alive. So I literally sat down and jotted down a checklist. What kind of education did I need? This is a prairie boy from a farming town originally in, in northern Alberta, Canada. I don't have any ocean experience, so I had to do my yacht master training. First, before that, I had to do my day skipper training. I, I, a lot of the, the navigation and meteorology stuff is similar to aviation, but I had to know how to read tide charts. I had to get my marine radio operator's license, and I wrote all this stuff down. But it was like... Um, you're going in blind in a way, but but with my experience as an expeditionist, I was able to make a checklist that covered all the bases, and I actually did go out and do it successfully in the fastest crossing ever and come back alive. So somehow, and I really attribute this to my aviation background, I made the checklist that got me back alive. So super important, but you can use it in less critical situations on a daily basis. Like I said, you know what makes a good day. Write it down and do it do it yeah there's a great book uh we've written about it it's the power i think it's the checklist manifesto is what it's called go on day yep absolutely yeah yeah check that it's fantastic yeah and it's uh you know as an airline pilot we uh we use checklists all the time you do not fly an airplane without a checklist i flew this morning and i did i can't even count how many checklists and switches i had to do but all operated via checklist even though i've done it thousands and thousands of times and it's uh, it's the only way to go in a lot of situations in life right because it just reduces that human error it, it, it helps reduce human error and when you're doing something that you do over and over and over and over again you think that you're an expert and you think it can happen to you like all of us think that but uh this checklist these checklists force you to follow procedure and and Checklists are what we say are written in blood. The reason that there are checklists is because other pilots have killed themselves because they forgot that switch. And all of these standard operating procedures and checklists are written in blood. And That goes for mountaineering, that goes for aviation, that goes for sailing or ocean rowing. And uh, you learn from the mistakes of others. So I'm sure there's a lot of men listening to you uh, tell about your adventures you've been on. And they're thinking, this sounds great. I'd love to do it. But like I'm not a pilot, so I can't get the the flyers discount. That sounds really expensive to you know get equipped for a a trek up Mount Everest. What's your advice to these guys who want to go on a, these you know adventures like this, but they don't think they it's in their, their their wheelhouse or in the realm of possibility? I guess it's um, it's like anything. If you prioritize, here's an example. If you're a, a young married couple and all of a sudden you have a child that you weren't planning on or you weren't to, um, expecting. Yeah, the reason expecting literally, but if you, if you beforehand had decided not to have a child because you couldn't afford it, when that child comes along, you all of a sudden figure out a way to give that child what it needs in life. And you, you 
pay for it. Literally, you fund that child's life. You can do that with any type of goal if you really want to do it. It's amazing how when you get focused on something, and maybe this is something that has to do with, or that's that's peculiar to people that like myself that do these expeditions and have these sort of lofty goals, I guess, is that uh, once I get focused on something, it's amazing how things start to fall into place and how you find the money to do that, how you find the time to do that, how you negotiate this or you arrange that. If you really want to do it, I mean, it sounds cliche. If you really want something, you really have to do what it takes. Now, what I also like to say is you just don't want something. You don't say, I want to be uh, an airline pilot. You say, what do I need to do to become an airline pilot? What do I need to do to be a solo ocean rower? I don't want to row the North Atlantic. What do I need to do to do that? And you figure it out. You sit down. You've got the benefit of Google. You've got the benefit of things like podcasts, believe it or not, where there are so many tidbits that you can pick up to get these things done. And if you really want it, you're going to be able to get to there, to, to that uh, to that goal, or at least to the starting line of that goal. And then once you get there, you're the one who's got to unzip that tent and step out of the door at uh, high camp on Everest, or shove off the dock into the North Atlantic by yourself. But you have the means of getting to that point before you step out or shove off. And I think that's really something that people have to be aware of is they can make these things happen. And uh, if you are going to do something, prepare for it. Prepare for it, though. Please do the hard work. None of this stuff comes easy. It's years and years of training. It's um, sitting at night in front of a computer doing a course on on ocean navigation. It's it's researching Google Map images and Google Earth. It's it's learning the local language so you can ask, are there landmines here? You can ask, how do I get there? Where do I buy fuel? Uh, help me. Where is water? That type of stuff. And there's a, there's a very famous saying that I've fallen back on in years from a, it's a Greek philosopher, philosopher named Archilochus. He said, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. And I like to add dreams and hopes, but we fall to the level of our training. So no matter what you hope for, no matter what you pray for, unless you're prepared for that, when this shit hits the fan, so to speak, it's your training that's going to get you out of these situations or successfully to these situations or into them. Yeah, you mentioned you said pick up or was it step off, step out and shove off. Yeah. It's sort of like become your motto, right? It has. It really has to to grab a tent zipper at uh, high camp on Everest at uh, eleven o'clock at night and un- unzip that without oxygen and realize that you're out for the um, for the physically and maybe maybe not psychologically, but the toughest day of your life. It, uh, it takes a little bit of, well, it takes a, a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of preparation, and it takes a lot of confidence. And I think that's a positive feedback loop that comes from preparation. And there's nothing like it. Uh, you could make up a lot of excuses. You could say, I've got altitude sickness, that I'm sick. You could say that I'm too cold. You could say that I've got frostbite. You can make a ton of excuses to not step out of that tent, just like when I shoved off the dock into the North Atlantic. And stepping out and shoving off is very tough. The, the the only one that's really made me pause for a second was shoving into the North Atlantic because that was a whole different world. I mean, I literally had no ocean experience at all. But I, you know, I, I just like that checklist, I guess, proceeding through a checklist, I just sort of went step by step, wave by wave and, and made it across. And what's really interesting on the subject of ocean rowing is that it's the only, it's the only um, mode of travel I know that you're facing where you just came from. You're never looking at where you're going. And it's really strange because where you're going is always in your imagination. It's a compass heading that you can see by your feet. There's a compass between my feet on the boat. But you're only using your imagination to to get to where you're going versus canoeing down a river, seeing the next bend, or going around that rock, or climbing a ridge and going to that rock, or going to turn up that crevasse, or I'm going to get to that peak and follow that coal, or I'm going to ride my bike up that hill and by that road I'm going to turn right. It's a strange bit of a um, psychological test when you're rowing a boat for these distances. First of all, there's no markers out there and you're only using your imagination to get to where you want to be, which I think there's something there and I haven't quite figured it out yet. So not only were you doing these great adventures and being a pilot, but you're also balancing fatherhood as well. So how, 
how do you incorporate that element? Because I'm sure there's a lot of, I know when a lot of men, they get married and they have kids, they think, well, my days of adventures are over. You know, I had my 20s for that. I got to, I can't do that anymore. How do you balance adventure and family and career? Yeah, so luckily for me, I had the kids when I was in my 20s. Uh, other than Eric, I was in, I guess, early 30s when I had Eric. But uh, I just brought him along. I had the chariot I pulled behind my bicycle, and I'd go on long training rides in the mountains with uh, a little tiny kid behind me, a backpack. And then as soon as they were literally old enough to start riding a bike, they'd be on trips. I mean, when, when Richard was 13 and Andrea was 11, that's her daughter, we rode our bikes 800 kilometers in the Canadian Arctic up a gravel highway. They're the youngest people ever to have done that. And kids don't know what they don't know. And they don't know what they what they can or can't do. And that's what I love about them. They're this blank slate. And they pulled off this 800 kilometer remote Arctic Canada ride on their bikes. And it was just another bike trip. And uh, you just include them. We got them into skiing. We got them to ski racing. They became ski coaches, all three of them. Eric is a ski coach now at age 15. And we were in Japan a year ago, we are a year and a half ago, we, Janet toured around Tokyo and the kids and I climbed, skied up Mount Fuji and skied down it. We took a couple of days and did that. On Eric's 13th birthday, I took him to the most active volcano in Europe, which is um, on the Aeolian Islands. It's called Stromboli. And we sat on the rim and watched it erupt. I mean, these things kids can do without any issues and it's um, just bring them along. And it doesn't really slow you down that much, but it does give you a new level of, of awareness of your responsibility to come back alive. And, uh, and uh, you may be getting tired of airplane analogies or aviation analogies, but when there's an a aviation safety report, like I alluded to earlier, an accident, there's always a cause, and it's usually the pilot. And I never want my kids to see that I took a shortcut, that I, that I didn't follow my procedures, that I didn't have my safety harness on, that I didn't check my knot and that's what killed me, or that I, you know, I, I didn't have, I wasn't tied in when I fell into that crevasse. And because that'll be my epitaph on my tombstone for them, um, figuratively speaking, and I don't want that. So I'm really cautious about never taking shortcuts, even though I do some, you know, what, what I think some people think are very dangerous things. I do it in a very measured way and I'm extremely cautious. I didn't make one mistake on Everest other than freezing my hand, but I didn't do any shortcuts. I didn't shortcut my preparation. I didn't take any shortcuts literally on the mountain. And same with the boat. I, um, I was always tied into my safety line when I went onto the deck. It never, ever did I risk it, no matter how calm the water was, because I could have been knocked off by a rogue wave. I could have had a whale hit the boat, which I did have. I could have any situation, and I could have just simply disappeared, and it would have been my mistake. So makes you hyper aware of, uh, of, uh, of risk mitigation. Definitely. And I guess another aspect of being able to balance family and doing this adventure stuff is also marrying someone who's on board oh, with your adventure lifestyle. Absolutely. That's such a critical, I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who, if the wife was told that the husband was going to climb ever at auction, she just says, well, get on with it. Sort of uh, basically is what she said is you're not getting younger. That's the exact quote. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. She's got this uh, level of uh, confidence in me that sometimes is a little disturbing. She always thinks I'm uh, guaranteed to come back, although the ocean was especially difficult. I remember we had a dinner before I left, just her and I, and the way back. I, I took the whole family, actually, to Europe to see the boat when it was being built. I wanted them to see what an ocean rowing boat was and how safe it was, and I actually went out and rowed the boat with Eric. So we actually tested it, let him row it, let him sort of get used to the systems on it. So that's, he was sort of my touch point with Janet and Andrea, and, and he could explain the systems to them. And, and this thing is literally like a, almost like a uh, space capsule. It's that tough, and it's, it's, it almost looks like a space capsule from the Apollo days inside. It's got this tiny little cockpit with this door that seals, and it, it's quite robust. But I took them there, and then on the way back, we stopped in Reykjavik, Iceland, and Janet and I went for dinner. And, I mean, we were both in tears. You know, she, she was... You know, sort of in desperation saying to me, why do you do this stuff? What drives you to do this? Why on earth would you want to row across the North Atlantic Ocean? What is wrong with you? And I, you, you can't respond. It's, it's very difficult. And it is the biggest negative aspect of this type of life is, is, the, um, is the worry and the, I guess, the suffering you can put your loved ones through. But luckily for me, even though I think... Um, I've really tried to make my own luck. I've always come back alive, yeah. minus a few digits. 
Right, minus a few digits. So I mean, I guess you were doing this adventuring stuff before you married her. So she kind of she knew what she was getting into. I think uh, just four or five days after I met her, I took off to Kilimanjaro. Okay. So it was she never she's never known anything different. Yeah, I think it'd be hard if you you marry someone and then you're like five years later, hey, honey, I'm going to become an adventurer. <laughs> you know what would really scare her is if I said, hey, honey, I'm going to take up golfing. She would absolutely <laughs> panic. <laughs> What's wrong? Something's wrong. <laughs> well, Laval, this has been a great conversation. Is there some place people can go to learn more about your work and the other adventures you plan on going on here in the future? Well, that's a quite like, do you have any adventures planned? Oh, I was scared you were going to ask me that. I've always got many uh, being planned. I've got one of the seven summits left. It's the highest peak in Antarctica called Vinson. I'm just sort of, it's not a very difficult peak. It's only 16,000 feet high. It's basically just a flight in there and you spend 10 days uh, ski mountaineering to the top. I'd like to combine it with something else though. So maybe a South Pole expedition. So that's on my mind. And usually when these things uh, are on my mind, they start to fester and they turn into something. And I also want to do a desert crossing, a big desert crossing, something that's never been done. So that one's a little bit confidential. So I'm, um, I'm working on doing a, a desert crossing. And of course, all my trips are human powered. It's not going to be on a motorcycle or on a, uh, in a Jeep or anything like that. So I'm uh, working on uh, those two. Plus all the time I'm doing stuff. We just got back from Central Europe. Jana and I, she, she's a big wine expert. So we toured all over Central Europe. And while she was doing wine tours, I was running up the highest mountain in Hungary, the highest mountain in Poland, to the highest mountain in the Czech Republic. So wherever we go, I try and, uh, stay active, get a run in and bag a peak or two. So it's a real passion. So there's always something going on. Is there, is there some place people can go to like follow you on these adventures? Sure. Yeah. So you can go to my Twitter account. It's probably the best. I'm pretty active on Twitter and on Instagram. And it's just at Laval St. Germain. So that's L-A-V-A-L-S-T-G-E-R-M-A-I-N. And my website is my name.com. No period after the T in the uh, website. So LavalleStGermain.com. And uh, there's a contact uh, form in there. You can reach out there. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and obviously Facebook as well. I'm on Facebook. I'm sort of new to that, but uh, really active on uh, Twitter and uh, and Instagram. And I'm also a public speaker. So I, I, I got hired to talk about these things, which I absolutely love sharing these uh, these stories of I call it lessons learned from the uh, beyond the waves and above the clouds. And that's really what it is because I think as uh, men, especially, we love these tales of adventure where the climber, you're watching them from the bottom of the mountain, they do, they disappear above the mists into the cloud and you wonder what's going on up there or a boat that disappears over the ocean horizon. And it's um, I've always wanted to know what happened uh, out of sight and I've been doing it. So I really love sharing my uh, stories. Well, Laval St. Germain, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Brett. My guest today was Laval St. Germain. He's an adventurer, airline pilot, and family man. You can find more information about his adventures and follow him on his adventures by going to lavalsaintgermain.com. All one word, no period in the between the St. Germain. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Laval, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. If you enjoy the show, you've gotten something out of it since you've been listening to it, I'd appreciate it if you take one minute to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. It helps us out a lot. As always, thank you for your continued support. And until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Stay manly.